Jain everybody. When a drone is fired for more than 2000 kilometers from women and lands in Tel Aviv, defying their comprehensive RN drone system, the world sits back and takes a note. Same thing happens when Houthis fire such systems in Red Sea. You would have seen as to how close to 50 kilometer long line was seen outside Kyiv in the initial stages of battles of uh, Russia and Ukraine about the tanks being you know, lined up. But thereafter, you know, nothing progressed. All of you who would have been monitoring Russian Ukraine conflict in some way would have realized that even a country like Russia, who is the second largest uh, defense equipment exporter and supplies to more than 85 countries in the world today, was not able to replenish these equipments in time. Even there, neither they were able to repair their in battlefield conditions, nor they were able to replenish it with the new items. They had to run around left, right and center. They had to even depend on the countries to whom they had exported their equipment earlier with some bit out of that, besides coordinating with, you know, uh, China, North Korea and others for multifarious activities. So, as we see the world today, besides the strategical, operational and tactical thoughts, uh, equipment plays the most important uh, part in deciding the outcome of a battle. And therefore, its maintenance, repair, and overall is very, very critical. It assumes much more importance in Indian conditions when we are transiting from the uh, bulk import equipment model to indigenous models slowly and steadily. We also have our borders, as far as China is concerned, in high altitude areas or mountainous areas. And even the JNK portion of Pakistan is in mountainous region, which enhances the uh, challenge. But then everything is not that bad. Technology has become a great savior, provided we are able to leverage the technology for enhancing our capability for credible MRO. We couldn't have got a better speaker than General Agrawal, who has been the ex dg AME and is a subject matter expert on this particular field, who will take us through as to how, through technology infusion, we can address the challenges being faced by the MRO. Uh, before I request General Agrawal to speak, I'll request my colleague, Karun KJ Singh, to uh, introduce the speaker, and then we will listen to General Agrawal. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege to introduce today's esteemed speaker, Lieutenant General K.K. Agrawal, AVSM, SM, BSM, retired. He was commissioned into Corps of EME in December 1979. General Agrawal has made a remarkable career spanning nearly four decades. He holds an MTech in electronic engineering from prestigious IIT Kharagpur. And he's an alumni of both Defense Services Staff College and College of Defense Management. During his distinct career, General Agarwal has been instrumental in shaping the field of engineering support as he has formulated, tested, and institutionalized the concept of engineering support in the operational domain of the complete gamut of weapon system and equipment for various formation and unit which has been approved and published in the GS pamphlet. Among his many leadership roles, he served as technical advisor to the government of Mauritius and he also played a pivotal role as chairman to Army Pay Commission Shell Cell during 7th Pay Commission. Besides his military achievement, General Agarwal has a keen interest in MRO, merging technology, indigenization, defense manufacturing, and finance. His unwavering dedication and commitment to excellence are all marks of his career. Culminating in his retirement as a Director General EME after an extraordinary 39 and, a half, 39 and a half years of service in 2019. Today, we are indeed fortunate to have General Agarwal as, a, as his invaluable insight into critical topic of MR. His wealth of experience and deep understanding of the subject 
will undoubtedly provide us with a unique and enriching perspective. Jan, viewers, first I would like to thank Jan Ashok, the Director, Center for Joint Warfare Studies, for having invited me to deliver this talk, and also Colonel KJ for having spoken kind words about me. I represent the MRO forum here, which is uh, ably spearheaded by uh, Dal Matharu. And of course, uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, I will try and uh, decipher this topic, topic of reimagining MRO for defense, realistically leveraging technology. Now, at the turn of this century, uh, all of us started hearing uh, this term, uh, revolution in military affairs, the RNA. And over the last two decades, militaries the world over have been swept by this revolution in military affairs, which is predicated on rapid advances in technology, which in turn have altered the doctrines and tactics of war fighting. Now, this RMA has gained further stimulus uh, with the uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine war, now more than two and a half years old. Now, this technology has also led to a revolution in military logistics, especially in the realm of, of, uh, realm of uh, supply chains and military inventories. However, what has not happened is the MRO domain, that by and large has remained untouched for the last two decades or decades, whatever you call, except for uh, you know, repeated rounds of manpower optimization uh, for improving the teeth to tail ratio. Even the Shekatkar committee ultimately has ended up only in optimizing manpower with its recommendations on uh, privatization or corporatization as far as defense forces are concerned, not making much headway. Meanwhile, what has happened is all the you know efforts at, at modernization of the infrastructure for MRO or technology insertion in MRO, they haven't gained traction because of various reasons. And now we have reached a stage that uh, you know, although all appears well on the equipment availability front, but the professionals know that MRO is, you know, fast reaching a stage. Uh, it is, uh, you know, the problems have got so much exacerbated that it will be a struggle to maintain the equipment readiness and mission reliability levels unless serious uh, attempts or serious actions are taken to rethink the whole MRO structure. Now, uh, the urgency also stems from a couple of uh, external triggers, uh, which make it uh, evident that incremental changes to MRO will no longer suffice. You require transformative changes now. I will now touch upon these uh, triggers uh, uh, for transformative change in the MRO domain. The first impulse is the defense budget itself. While in absolute figures, every year we, we hear that, you know, uh, this budget, this is the highest ever allocation for defense. True, in absolute terms. But in real terms, the defense budget has been continuously going down. No, if you see as a percentage of GDP or even as a percentage of, of central government expenditure, I think, you know, as a percentage of GDP, 
In the 80s, it used to be 3.5% of the GDP, the defense budget. Now, it's gone a secular decline, especially over the last 20 years. And today, excluding pensions, it is about 1.4% of the GDP. So from 3.5, you come to 1.4, which is about the lowest level since the, the China war in 1960. To put things in perspective, globally, the global defense expenditure is approximately 2.3% of the global GDP. We are at 1.4%. There are 31 NATO countries out of them 11 of them spend more than 2% of uh, the GDP on defense. So purely from the, the, uh, this perspective, purely from these figures, it appears that you know, if you spend 1.4%, we must be having a very peaceful borders, no problems with the neighborhood. You can afford to spend 1.4%. But is that the case? Now, coming to the absolute figures, I'm not having seen the GDP, percentage of GDP, and coming to the absolute figures. In the year 2023-24, the defense budget increased by 1.5% over the RE figures of the earlier financial year, 1.5%. This budget, this financial year, it is uh, 6.22 lakh crore defense budget. And below is the, the last year, it is increased by 4.79%. Interim and financial budget this year, they're actually uh, they're hardly any difference in the same. Coming to the, you know, uh, of this budget, the revenue budget is 2.82 lakh crore. Reserve is 2.7 lakh crore last year, which means a increase of 4.4%. Now, if you see that the annual, you know, the inflation itself contributes to about 10%. So, as long as any increase is less than 10%, the actual real value is decreasing. The revenue budget, if you consider that pay budget, you know, pay budget is inelastic because the salaries have to go up by the you know, uh, order of inflation, approximately 10% in a year. The order of the revenue budget, the salary budget has gone up by 10%. So what has happened is the budget available for sustenance and operational readiness has got actually in real terms, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, actual figures also, the availability is reduced with respect to the last year. So, if the budget for spares, upgradation, operational readiness keeps reducing in actual terms every year, then how do you meet the challenges? With the inventory every year going up, you are maintaining legacy equipment, you are maintaining current equipment, you are acquiring new equipment. The inventory is all the time going up, but the funds available are going down. So, meet the challenge. Now I come to another challenge, which is uh, in a different domain. I'll talk of the Agnipat scheme. I'll not talk of the pros and cons of the Agnipat scheme. I I'll only talk of how it impacts the MRO. Okay. Uh, the Agnipat scheme was introduced uh, in June 2022, more than two years back. Before that, uh, we had a, a manpower recruitment uh, ban because of COVID. Pre-COVID, I've taken the figures uh, from an authoritative source, which said that the uh, the total tree services, the recruits under training were 74,575. So that year intake was 74,575 people into the army regular the, as per the earlier recruitment system. Now, what do we have? Uh, what do we have in Agnipa? You are getting annually 92,000 people. So you say, okay, 92,000 versus 74,000? Increase? Actually, not so. It is increased only for the first four years when there are no exits, only 94,000 coming. But after the first four years, 
when out of these 92,000, only 23,000 people are retained. So after fourth year, the manpower will start reducing every year. <laughs> so willy-nilly, you are having after the fourth year, that means after 2027, 23,000 people getting into the forces against approximately 75,000 earlier, all three services combined. So you can imagine the huge squeeze in manpower. Now, when I speak of this, you know, uh, a couple of months back, I was uh, in another think tank in a gathering like this, where there were uh, civilian experts, civilian intelligentsia, and of course, the senior veterans from the three forces also. So inevitably, people will say, okay, no problems. Uh, you know, the, the scheme will be tweaked. Your 92,000 can be increased anytime. Or there are three variables, you know, that uh, four years can be increased to six years, problem will get solved. Or 75, 25% uh, retention can be increased to 50%, problem will be solved. So, no problem. To those I had to bring out, through mathematical models and a dynamic uh, modeling scheme, I had brought out, the moment you increase 25% to let's say 40% or 50%, or you increase four years to six years, or you increase 92,000 to let's say 1.2 lakh or 1.5 lakh, your pay and pension merit increases from the present levels. So is it feasible? My point was, okay, tweaking is desirable upwards. It will not happen because of your mathematical models predict that what will be the pay and pension budget after five years, after 10 years, after 20 years. You, 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 you change any of these three variables, you will get the answer. And when you see all this, you'll come to a conclusion that uh, when, if the Agni Path scheme cannot be tweaked upwards because of the pay and pension budget consideration, then what is the option? Either you have continued the same manner or you scrap it. Now, if I assume that it is going to continue in the same manner, it's an assumption only because it cannot be tweaked upwards, then what is going to happen is in 20 years of time, the three forces strength will reduce to about 8 lakhs. From the 15, 16 lakhs, it will reduce to 8 lakh level. Now, the, uh, just to, as a representative figure, an infantry battalion from existing 750, 800 strength will reduce to 450. Or, if you keep the strength same, then the number of infantry battalions will reduce by almost half in Indian Army. Now, if the strength of the arms uh, decreases to almost half, obviously the maintainers and the service providers and logistics, they will their strength will also come down in in, in equal measure. So what I'm saying is you have another big threat. Even if the Antipat scheme is continued for five years, ten years, we not we whatever, the manpower optimization, substantive manpower optimization is on the horizon. So now you have two big constraints, budget, manpower. Apart from the usual things, which I said earlier, usual pain points, you have two, the, the, these two big problems. So the moot question is, can the existing setup of MRO function efficiently with this drastically reduced manpower Increasing repertoire of weapon systems and decreasing fund availability. Can the existing MRO system still deliver the goods or we require a total rethink for the future? Now, what I'm saying is now, uh, you know, these, these challenges, uh, if you have to meet these challenges head on, then you require transformative changes in the MRO setup. And this, the, the, whatever change we are going to conceptualize and implement, it should uh, be tailored to the needs of Defense 2050. Because it has to be gradually implemented over the next 20 years, it cannot be implemented overnight. So you have to think the the contours of this new MRO scheme 
technology insertion is a must in a resource efficient system you have to make the system resource efficient technology insertion is a must in fact it's a it's a sign for non however this technology insertion also has to be planned re realistically because technology has got upfront costs and given the the constraints of the budget we cannot have you know uh, large scale or you know technology insertion which is not planned well enough so when i say we have to reimagine the mro system let's see the existing mro system what are the characteristics so the existing mro system uh, in the army we have a echelon uh, repair system all have read about it there used to be four echelons light field intermediate base then it got compressed to three echelons and then we adopted the terminology oid level of repairs so one is the echelon system second is it is manpower intensive obviously the manpower component is quite large it is about 8% of in army it is about 8% of the overall manpower so the of course the manpower intensive there is very limited automation there is no central mro network there are only local level some automation done and uh, there is very limited automation to say modernization has suffered because of various reasons various committees coming up and the modernization keeps getting you know postponed further very little modernization there is inadequate overall capability of national capability i'm talking of inadequate overall capability of warlay systems weapon system equipment and there is perennial shortages of the requisite spares assemblies modules particularly those which are of foreign origin now we we we, we spoke of the fresh constraints you know defense budget and and uh, the manpower constraints so with this you know if you apply the theory of constraints you you will come to the conclusion that the incremental changes will will no longer suffice we have to come with something new you know transformative think uh, the whole gamut of the mro setup have a fresh look for it so accordingly uh, i have uh, thought of you know 10 tenets or 10 props of the new system around which the system can be rebuilt first is the you know separate tri services mro computer network we all agree that uh, automation is the key automation is the key whenever we have to do more with less that means high efficiency with lower manpower automation is the answer so we require a pan india tri services mro network which should form the backbone of the new mro system now uh, why i am saying tri services in any case we are talking you know we have joint venture we are talking of theater commerce and all that so inevitable is that we have a, a tri services uh, mro network which will assist in pooling skills technical infrastructure capacities for overall or recapitalization of equipment especially for equipment which is used by more than one service let's say uh, helicopters small arms air defense equipment communication equipment which are common a lot of commonality in the three services at least for these three services we must have a common infrastructure and the mro uh, 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 pan india tri services mro network which can be suitably segmented either equipment wise or you can even segment it uh, uh, formation unit wise and uh, that that forms the that is the, the basic building block of the new mro system my second point is uh, having a war like equipment centric system focus should be on warlike equipment we can 
you know eliminate the civil and use equipment especially like uh, you know v vehicles that can be handled separately or very interesting civil infrastructure is also quite good enough let's focus on the war like equipment on weapon systems on platforms and this system i propose is each weapon system or platform will have a designated operator who will be responsible for inputting the mission capable status of that particular weapon system or platform into this uh, tri services mro network on a daily basis or whenever the status changes it is it should be identified and and inked now uh, when you when you input this on the centralized network and this network is accessible to all the formation repair echelons it is accessible to the commanders and it is accessible to a, a let's say a central analytics team and a central analytics module which will ride on this on this uh, air india drive services network and uh, this uh, this specialist and an analytical team will keep a tab on the equipment readiness and on the mission reliability of equipment they will be responsible for preempting problem areas and tendering advice to senior commanders my next tenet is you know uh, collapsing the 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 mro echelons you know i spoke of the oid especially in army i will talk of uh, you know o is the that light repair level and uh, uh, units or regiments have their own complement of the maintainers the, the mro people and uh, last two decades at least uh, i i can say there are two serious attempts made at implementing user repair concept once in 2002 and another time around 2010 and uh, because of objections from various uh, stakeholders both the times the user repair concept was junk so what i am saying is it is finally time to implement the repair concept save a lot of manpower and i when i say uh, save a lot of manpower i am not saying that leave the, the units and regiments Uh, as far as their equipment is concerned, leave them hand dry. I am not saying that. We'll have alternative arrangements. How? I'll come to this. So uh, effectively, what I'm saying is, let's have only two H launch or repair. From O I D, I cut out O. Go left with I, and D D or D or F R effective repairs. Effectively, you have two H launch or repair. You save a lot of resources without compromising. the effectiveness and efficiency of mro how that will happen i i now when we say the user repair concept and and uh, you know cut out the o level the the equipment operators in the units and regiments they will uh, require assistance carrying out light repairs so uh, we we have a, a centralized network mro network there will be a equipment helpline where the operator in case of a problem can log on to the equipment helpline there will be specialists available on the helpline who will be able to do remote diagnostics of the equipment and help him help the the operator of the equipment in undertaking necessary adjustments in the equipment and if required you know uh, if you require to train him or you required to carry out modifications then we have you know uh, modules extended reality modules whether augmented or virtual uh, reality modules riding on this this central network which can be gainfully utilized apart from you know ai based chatbots etc all those things can be inbuilt along with this this central mro network which i am talking about my next uh, suggestion is that Uh, we ensure minimal move of equipment for field or high level repairs to the designated mro facility or the workshop okay right now what happens is 
that in case there is a problem, the equipment uh, is, is taken from the unit to workshop, uh, which may be 10 kilometers away, which may be 50 kilometers away. In case of uh, D-level repairs, it may be 1,000 kilometers away. Even if it is 10 or 20 or 30 kilometers away, in, in certain areas like Ladakh, it may be in uh, travel time of two days or three days. So it this all builds into the you know the downtime of equipment and the inefficiencies of the system. So what I'm saying is, as far as possible, do not move the equipment to the to the MRO workshop, but move an in situ repair team to the equipment. And uh, by the way, this has been tried out and implemented successfully by me in 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 uh, saying Ladakh region I've done that very really successful it was recognized nationally right? within the army so uh, what i'm saying is except for equipment which requires specialized infrastructure electronic equipment requires clean rooms or require special yeah. vehicle fixtures there's no need of equipment with two people or four people or six people with a transport going to the equipment rather than move a uh, specialist to that site and uh, they carry out the repairs. Now, when you do that, when you when you uh, implement this kind of a system, then you require a pool of uh, equipment specialists, which is my next point. The formation engineering support units or the formation MRO units, you know, they have a pool of equipment specialists based on the equipment profile of that formation. They move for in situ repairs. And uh, you know, do away with the requirement of transporting the equipment to the unit. And since the system has to be lean and mean, I'm not saying that you have the only the requisite number of equipment specialists authorized to that formation MRO. But in case there, there will be there will be occasions when you require some some augmentation of that pool. Well, you can take it from the neighboring formation MRO echelons. Have a sharing system. And uh, thus be able to implement this uh, system of minimal move of equipment to the MRO echelons effectively. My next point is, you know, uh, regarding the D-level capability, the overall or recapitalization capability. We have a tremendous problem. We have an ever-increasing backlog of recapitalization of major war fighting equipment which actually has a direct bearing on the combat potential of the forces what we need to do is augment increase the national e level repair overall recapitalization capability when you say national uh, it may uh, involve the, the defense industrial complex the, uh, as far as the defense industrial complex, the major one the, the, are, are the PSUs, are the DPSUs, the ordnance factory boards, okay. and some some within the forces, whether in army, air force, maybe within the force also we have uh, army base workshops or, or BRDs, etc. Within the forces, so we need to augment their capability. In future, the the private sector can be invited; they can get. Now, I'll explain you with examples what is the problem like. Let's say I, I'll take the example of the armored fighting vehicles. I just take some figures, uh, may not be actual figures, just for the purpose of explanation. Let's say tank T72, uh, the existing capability, let's assume it is 100 tanks per year. Out of which 50 is within the army and the rest is with the order effect. But the uh, arising, overall arising is at 200 per year. So what will happen every year? You have a backlog of 100. And it keeps accumulating. And like I said, it ultimately uh, uh, you know, impacts the combat potential of the forces. So what we need to do, we need to increase the capacity from 100 to 200 or more national capacity. Now, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, recommendations came out eight years back, Shekhar Committee, you know, they privatized the, the, the base of shops. 
are not going into the pros and cons of the recommendation are uh, where it where the policy there were a lot of from from policy problems but i'll skip that i'll only bring out the conceptual flaws in the whole thing let's say i said i give you the example of tanks we have in in, in built uh, you know within the forces capacity of 50 tanks now that how is the 50 arrived at it is arrived at by the technical infrastructure you have tank base of let's say 50 or 40 tank base of you have technical infrastructure for overall of our tables, require space, require manpower, you have train manpower. Uh, then you have the time, you know, that is sacrosanct based on the DOT or the MTOT, the OEM, the Russians have said, okay, overall will take, let's say, take 30 weeks, not reduce below 30 weeks unless you compromise with the quality. So it's a 30 weeks fixed. We have only 50 times and we have spares and this thing. So capacity maximum is 50. Maybe we end up doing 40 every year because of spares are not available, engines are not available, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you bring private sector, you say you operate this plant, his capacity is also 50. Maybe with his, assuming he's got higher efficiency, he may increase 40 to 50. But what happens to the national backlog? Nothing is being 100 remains 100. So every, every year, the backlog is uh, increasing. So you have not tackled the root of the problem. And the, the way out has to be, you invite private sector to establish greenfield projects. Okay, engine overall. You require 200 engines of uh, tank T-70 deals to be overall. We do not have capacity. Our existing defense industrial complex does not have capacity. Please establish a new greenfield facility. You go ahead. And because private sector, uh, sector is quite uh, nimble in the fact that they can quickly enter into foreign collaborations, they can have the supply chains uh, tied up. Unlike the government sector, these things take a lot, lot, lot of time. So if he successfully manages to establish a greenfield facility, it is cutting down your backlog. It is enhancing ultimately the combat potential of the force. This is not happening. You're trying to muddle up the existing system without increasing the national capacity. So that is the conceptual flaw I talk about. There are, I gave an example of uh, the air wheel. There are some low-hanging fruits also, you know, let's say, Kolos uh, Tatra trucks, something, or possible air wheel, easier. There are people doing overall of Kolos Tatra. I'm, I'm aware Air Force is getting it done. Or probably sometime pilot bases got done. The huge backlog of overall of Kolos Tatra. We haven't tapped the, the private sector. There is no hanging fruit. No, we have not tapped the private sector. So that is what I'm saying. You have to enhance the B level capacity of the repair uh, recapitalization weapon system. There may be 30, 40 major equipment which is required to immediately take. So that is where we have to we, we have to think and we have to implement rather than doing whatever we have been doing. Next is, you know, manufacture indigenization of spares and modules by private industry. Well, very easily understood, you know. Uh, of course, the ordnance factories are there. They have built a, built an ecosystem. They have those private vendors. They are supplying. Their capacities are limited, uh, still leading to the shortfall of uh, the spares and modules. So we need to see how we can uh, increase the capacity. Uh, I've been, uh, you know, uh, in a different context, I have been recommending something uh, like a, we have a make two system for, for capital acquisition. We should have a make three, I'm just calling it three, make three system for the manufacture of uh, these uh, spares and modules and engines and assembly. Wherein it is make three system, I akin to make, make two system is part of the DTL, is part of the, the revenue procurement procedures. And uh, the private sector is facilitated, is handheld, so that if it manages to successfully create a capacity, let's say, uh, example of you know, SGV side gearbox, if somebody ties up some abroad somewhere, some tie up, and starts producing SGV, we should order SGVs from it rather than importing it or rather than suffering shortages and having uh, our uh, fleet uh, out of action. So you have to facilitate uh, the the manufacture of these by the private sector. Next, I come to something which I spoke in passing, modernization of 
our own infrastructure. Now, for, like I said, for various reasons, some some committee, some recommendation, somewhere it comes up, and it becomes an excuse for further postponing the modernization of uh, yeah, our own infrastructure. And uh, of course, there is a resource crunch, and because of the resource crunch, uh, these things always are on lower priority, and uh, they keep getting postponed. One five-year plan to another five-year plan, and so on and so forth. It never happens. Now, when this happens, there is no modernization. It, it has an adverse impact not only on the quantity of the output, but the quality of the output. So, what uh, uh, I'm recommending, I'm saying modernization. I'm not saying, you know, keeping the resource crunch in mind. I'm only recommending outcome based modernization. I'm not even, you know, let's say we are just talking about coming to the director there. You know, uh, IoT based sensors for predictive maintenance. I'm not even recommending that because they're probably expensive, especially for our forces, which have a pan India presence and a huge, huge uh, inventory, not cost effective. I'm saying outcome based, cost effective modernization. If you want an ERP system, maybe it can be, it can ride on the central uh, that have our network, which I spoke of. So, we have to identify where modernization is essential based on careful considerations. Next, and a very, very important uh, facet is inventory support by logisticians. You must have all heard every year we hear shortage of spare, shortage of quantities, shortage of. Perineal. And uh, the supply chain inefficiency. Uh, some work has been done, I, I'm not saying that. It's here, some work has been done by means of you know, computerized inventory control systems. Uh, of course, uh, my opinion on that is also a little, of course, we require to change to a dynamic lead time system rather than a static lead time system. That is for a different subject. But what I'm saying is, this, uh, the logistics, logistics system, the spares backup system, the computerized inventory control system. This needs to be reconfigured based on the tenets of the new MRO system, which we are talking about, which we are trying to visualize or reimagine for the next 25 years. Now, uh, the, uh, primarily, I, I think there are three, three aspects on this. Firstly, uh, you have to, we have been talking of push, pull, push, push, pull, push system, you have to implement the push system of delivery. So once you have a central uh, network and you know MRO network, so any to be any unit formation shape, aircraft or whatever is modern, they 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 punch in the, the requirement and uh, it should be tackled centrally instead of the echelon system in the logisticians also we have a central depot, we have a intermediate depot, then you have a formation depot and uh, a huge system. So you say the centralized system uh, Backed by a network, anybody puts in a demand, wherever the, the item is available, it should be delivered directly. Push system, it should be directly delivered to that unit uh, shape or the aircraft or so on directly, let's say within 48 hours, using whatever means of transportation. You use private courier, you, you use you know, your own agency for last mile connectivity in future, you use drones or whatever you do. But you say, okay, okay my tower references, a push model, a speed of delivery, I put it in uh, 48 hours, it is there. And the system has to be non-linear, non-hierarchical, based only on the most economic model. Okay. Now, given these three terms of references, the logisticians should be asked to design a fresh warehousing and inventory control system. So this being very important uh, for the success of the overall MRO system, which we are utilizing. So this uh, has to be supported by logistician system. Let them, you know, uh, concurrently make a system. It is concurrent with the execution of the, the new MRO system. And uh, this also should be planned to be completed, let's say, in a decade or so. Lastly, I come to the, you know, another thing. 
uh, establishment of tri services MRO hubs for D level and factory repairs. Now, for all uh, major weapon systems and equipment where you know state of the art proprietary technology is involved, the OEM is not willing to part with. And uh, for this thing, uh, D level or factory repairs, either we have to send the equipment back to uh, the origin that the, yeah, the OEM belongs, or sometimes the MRO hubs are established here. So, what I'm saying is at the time of the uh, acquisition of the weapon system itself, we build it into the system that there will be tri service, if required tri services, MRO hub, which will be set up in India. So that firstly, you you avoid the requirement of sending whether the equipment or its spares or modules abroad. Secondly, the tie-ups can be with the EPSU, there is the HL, there is the BML, there are so many other, if required, the tie-ups can be with private industry. But let us have the MRO hubs established here for D-level repairs. As a part of the process, as part of the system, as a as a compulsory part of the system, and the defense acquisition procedures should uh, accordingly be amended. Now, having spoken of the that these are ten ten different uh, solutions and different tenets, whatever you call, it, having spoken of them, I come back uh, to. Know what, what should be the way forward. As I have brought out, there is a double whammy. You know, fire is not there, budget is not there, and of course, the other regular constraints modernization, and fire intensive, space backup not being there, all those problems are there. So, what is happening is even today, at least in the army, we are still have one equipment availability, which is gives you a false sense of uh, complacency. Equipment availability, ninety-eight percent, ninety-nine percent. No, that is correct. If you graduate to equipment readiness levels, national reliability levels, how the equipment will function in, during operations and war, and what we need to do about uh, to do to improve its so the reimagined system uh, has to be totally revamped up. Open of the tenets and realistic, it has to be revamped with the twin constraints: budget and manpower. It has to be equipment centric, or like equipment centric. You have to encourage private sector. You have to encourage uh, indigenization. You have to encourage manufacture capability increasing. You have to find ways and means how uh, national level capability for D level repairs, recapitalization can be improved. Then the logisticians, the inventory guys have to simultaneously put up a new system which meets meets the requirements of this new MRO system. Now for doing all this, what I recommend is that uh, we have we constitute two tri services committees of subject matter experts. I've just spoken of the tenant, but you have to make a detailed roadmap. Okay. And uh, for that, I recommend two committees. One uh, will be the tri service committee of subject matter experts on MRO. The terms of reference of that is very clear that you know you, you are going to have reduced manpower availability in future. It's going to have reduced budget availability based on the trends which are quite evident now. And with this, you have to design a system where the equipment readiness and mission reliability at least first arrest the, the, the fall and then uh, plan for enhancing it. This committee could cooperate, uh, could co opt uh, the civilian experts, civilian MRO experts also. Maybe expert from MOD and an expert from the logistician, the inventory guys also. Simultaneously constitute another committee, committee of subject 
मैटर एक्सपर्ट ऑफ नो डिसीजन इन मेट्रिक नाउ गिवन दिस टेनेट्स ऑफ द न्यू एम आर ओ सिस्टम दे हैव टू डिजाइन अ न्यू वेयर हाउसिंग एंड इन मेट्रिक कंट्रोल सिस्टम and in this committee you have a cross cross uh, representation and amaro expert comes here and their expert goes to the west coast there is a cross pollination of ideas now uh, this committee of the decision their terms are written the clear post model 48 hours delivery or whatever the the, the thing, new system things is appropriate and you 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 function in a uh, non linear and non hierarchical mode of operation so once you have these uh, road map for this transformative changes put in place then i'm sure some kind of lean and mean organization would emerge towards mro defense 2050 so to conclude i would say that uh, our total focus has to be on uh, reimagine redefine and reengineering of mro defense towards vision mro in defense 2050 a bespoke solution to demands of defense equipment readiness and mission reliability zero thank you <clears throat> so we have just uh, heard an excellent expose on this important subject okay if there are no questions i shall revert back to the people who are physically present here nalin anything first aspect i want to put uh, across is that you know, the challenges in three services are different especially with the navy because both aircraft comes back on land for repairs and same is with the army But the challenges because of the sea are very different, and the operation and maintenance has to be done even when the ship, especially ship goes to sea, has to be maintained there. This has been debated many a times, especially with respect to the OI and D level, so whether the same operator uses a concept on a ship when she is at sea. That's a very important aspect, and I think in due course, probably I'm not aware for the 15 years now, they also completed experiments around to the best of the knowledge. So this aspect may not be common to all. Price also, yeah, I, yes. I feel. Then I would like to divide uh, the major inventory the three armed forces into two categories. The indigenous ones, part of them, which come through the audio route and are productionized by our PSUs or private entities, and a lot of imported weapons and sensors and equipment and all price services. So the commonality, which are you rightly brought out. I think it has to start with a very humble level. That, you know, what are the facilities? Say, so as, as an example, way back in 2002, when I was heading one of the state-of-the-art PCB repair center centers in a permanent old workshop, the best interaction was a visit by the DG Board of Signals or DG EME and similar. I mean, the commander passed from Air Force. Appreciate each other and go. But no formal mechanism to which you brought up a committee, starting with. Let's take generic equipment. A lot of systems. A PCB is in a PCB. Many times, without doing the form fit, maybe doing some function. There are many generic testers which are available, which with the yes. minimum data we can try and get it going. In such cases, these are the things which can be used commonly if the database of each and every facility in all facilities are known to a common person. Very complex PCB is required. Multi-layered PCBs with combinational testers. We are going to our way. Air Force is going this way. Yeah. Army is going this way. I doubt. I don't know again. Not today. But if the BRDs or EME centers or even dockyards, I got any common thing. So that is uh, one thing which I think at least for the yeah. foreign equipment. And I have a different, slightly different take, sir, uh, with regard to the indigenous equipment. That indigenous equipment. Rather than with the budget shrinking, as you rightly brought out, and the manpower shrinking, slowly I don't know. Navy is going there. All are docked as civilian personnel. I think the same with the army also. So I think civilian people do have. There are challenges, of course. The civilian manpower has a very these things require a lot of continuity. Yes. Every two three years, our, our technicians go away. Either retention, 
after retirement they should be available to us because wealth of experience is going away and they do require them so this is an important part which we have to see and rather than we doing everything ourselves the person who has produced a corporate in india given the responsibility in the beginning itself in it that is for the indigenous guy i think it will be cost effective but it yes. will be hcl or vml who has produced initially producing a indigenous gun farming he will yes we will actually it also at the end of night that process is on also yes. so that we get rid of our indigenous another important aspect which he started was indigenous products so all our ships are made in india a big discussion which should take this many years before between courts and the military grade it is again a different topic of discussion about i guess but in my opinion a lot of courts equipment you know they're so cheap compared to the same functionality so cheap you don't have to really have so much of manpower expensive they are not manpower essential no spares required they're available off the shelf you can buy several number of systems say in having issue of the ship why do i need an engineer it will cost me close that i am getting yes. few thousands in the market even with the same capability i can replace the thing rather than getting into the maintenance specs and uh, this interconnectivity less enjoys is what you know this is one of the most important criteria interoperability absolutely the things like vla tca which are common only the naval level has slight difference certain system requires stabilization Okay, okay. Sensors. So that a slight difference is only. Like I needed a radar on a ship, big one. My boss asked me, "Can it go very far?" Only similar is required. I think it's very good modified. So very important aspect for, like we say, quality ships on time, the repairs on time, and OEMs have to be nurtured to be shrinking budgets and this to do their job collectively. All these services will achieve much more. For all the common equipment, and standardize. Last point is standardize the procedures. Procedures yeah. for the uh, systems. I will be surprised that in three services there could be a lot of commonality in systems of systems, where we are doing everything in a separate way from the same company from the same country. So that commonality has to be there. Whatever we are doing. These are my small thoughts. And thank you so much. For that. Thank you for the insight. um you mentioned about the developing a logistic uh, program or a logistic how the logisticians work uh, a model completely in today's world when amazon logistics deliver item in 24 hours why can't we adapt or adopt what they follow what is so great about it that we have to redevelop something rather than accepting whatever it is i think we all have to accept that earlier it was the military who used to rule and the civil used to follow today it is vice versa and we need to adapt to that thoughts your comments so did not mention amazon and flipkart and all that but when i said uh, maximum 48 hours the idea was that only if they can deliver the it can happen in defense forces also for what we need to do is non hierarchical non linear system of delivery So right now, I brought up from central depot, it will come some intermediate depot. From intermediate depot, it will come to some the formation depot. Then it will come. You can put demand to me at formation depot. Then it will get extracted to there. Then it get extracted to there. That is why I said the logisticians have to design a new warehousing and inventory system. New warehouse. Have it. Uh, you have a central MRO network linked to your logisticians uh, computer inventory control network, and uh, you have. on the near system of demanding push system of delivering it gets delivered even if you use private courier you do whatever if things are not of classified nature you can use a private courier also, but deliver it in 48 hours i am saying 48 hours once you do detailed uh, you know draw a road map the detailed uh, nitty gritties of the whole road map instead of 48 hours you might just 36 hours or 72 hours but the 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 intent is to do something what you have said without naming it You have to design a new system. You can't have the existing system operating, and you demand today it uh, deliv- gets delivered delivered to you three months later. We cannot survive it. So the more challenge, in my opinion, is the availability of spare transportation. Yes, that is a tackleable problem. Most of the things obsolete, you don't have the spares available. Yes, that's what no. important. So that's why the private sector is to be encouraged. And what you said was very right. Standardization. 
and yeah. common means of repairs of all the modules. All the common things are same. Same system. That's very common. Commonality of protocols. All this has to be there. But uh, you, this will happen when you have a tri-services approach to very important. Uh, so little uh, questions. This is regarding that. What have you talked about? We talk about normal situation when we are sitting at home. We are not going for the operation. But like the AFP, when it is deep inside the enemy territory, then we require we require to think about that also. So what do you uh, because we are not talking about that? Because when we are inside the enemy territory, 30, 40 kilometers inside the enemy territory, like what happened in Ukraine and Russia, then inside the unit, then the repair, maintenance, and overall it takes it. I, I, I think you've got a raise a good question, but uh, uh, probably you're linking it when I said okay, do away with o, o level and, and the user repair concept. No, it does not impinge on this. Your, your example you gave the mechanized forces when they go for operations across the IB and into the deep territory, it is already inbuilt. And I talk of engineering support during operations. Your there's something called uh, in army uh, you, you're aware uh, a vehicle fr a, a v t f r means repairs a v t l r a v t l r is authorized to the regiment that is still remain there there is a v t f r in repair equipped with the equipment specialist equipped with spares equipped with tools and sjx so that is an integral part of the the uh, formation the mechanized formation which it when it crosses the border so that cannot be compromised. That will stay there. In the new MRO system, that cannot be compromised. The, as far as possible, in, I am saying, in fact, in situ repairs, in peace, definitely in, peace, in situ repairs, and during operations, also as far as possible, from the infrastructure point of view, if you don't require a very extensive infrastructure, uh, you will have it uh, wherever the equipment casualty happens. Even, uh, in fact, even in the past, Engines have been changed, the tank engines have been changed there uh, in, 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 during, in, in enemy, terrain, enemy territory. It will continue to be done. In fact, uh, uh, if you read the uh, GS pamphlets which were revised in 2020, uh, there are four or five GS pamphlets which have got revised, which give you details of how the engineering support will be provided during operations. All the nitty gritties are there. So, is that, is, since in the uh, recent GS pamphlets, many of you may not have read those. So, the solutions are there. At the end, it remains for me to thank Jill Agrawal for this excellent uh, coverage on MRO uh, aspects. Uh, gentlemen, this is very, very important uh, subject, uh, not only in the world, deep side, you know, we are not worried that much what happens there. But we in India, when you know the transgressions are continuing in East Nadda for more than four years, Pakistan is creating problems for us. There is a total collusion between uh, China and Pakistan. We have to keep our equipment fully operational, serviceable, and our powder dry, so that if a situation emerges, we are able to equip ourselves well. With that note, sir, thank you very much, and we shall look forward to your more interactions and deliberations in days ahead. Thank you very much.